So it's a pleasure to have uh, Rika Rinen visit us today. Um, early in the day for us, of course, and, and late for her. Uh, Rika is head of the terrestrial ecology section and professor of biology at University of Copenhagen. And her research includes uh, ecosystem gas exchange, especially um, biogenic volatile organic compounds. And that's what she's gonna tell us about today. In 2003, Rika received her PhD in environmental sciences from the University of Eastern Finland. And last year, she was awarded the Elite Research Prize by the Danish Ministry of Higher Education and Science. So Rika, thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction, Paul. And uh, yeah, we can take questions uh, on the go if you wish. I guess it's Claire looking on the chat and-, and Yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat and let yes. you know. Yeah, and uh, of course afterwards as well. So uh, there should be plenty of time for discussion afterwards. So we've had a really nice sunny day here in Copenhagen today. And now it's evening. I've had a little bit of dinner with my boys and, uh, and uh, now they are hopefully behaving while I give this talk. Uh, so I hope that you all get a nice day. Uh, and uh, and uh, I hope you also enjoy the talk. So I'm gonna try to share my screen now. And there it should be visible for you. Um, so my research, it's focusing on volatile organic compound uh, emissions from biological and ecological perspective and mainly in the Arctic ecosystems. Uh, so uh, in this talk, you can now sit back and uh, enjoy some views from the Arctic and uh, some stories of our field work there. So just to give it a bit of a background, I know that many of you are familiar with atmospheric sciences. Uh, the gases that I talk about uh, are really trace constituents of the atmosphere. So they have very low concentrations and very short lifetimes uh, in the atmosphere, which makes them tricky to measure. And uh, there are many challenges uh, that have slowed down the progress in this field. Biogenic volatile organic compounds are uh, gases that many of you have also sensed. So many, many of them have a particular smell or scent. And uh, as you know, you may have also seen aerosol particles or blue haze on top of the forested mountains that are formed from the BVOCs. These gases are important from uh, biological perspective. So there's a lot of research going on into different ecological interactions. So it's not just a uh, useless uh, loss of carbon for the plants, but plants are using these uh, gases for many uh, interactions, like flowers inviting pollinators or leaves deterring uh, insects that feed on them uh, and many other other functions also related to atmospheric chemistry. So, so some VOCs uh, react with oxidants like ozone within or uh, on the surface of the leaves and thereby they can protect uh, vegetation uh, from oxidative stress. Then there's the other side, the importance for atmospheric uh, chemistry and atmospheric composition. So when the VOCs are released to the atmosphere, they react rapidly in complex reactions that uh, many of you know much better than I do. And uh, what I tell people that are interested in our work is that uh, there is ozone production or consumption where VOCs uh, may play a role. And then particle formation or particle growth that are relevant for climate. So there are these different impacts in the atmosphere that motivate our, our research. And our group uh, is working in between these two disciplines of uh, VOC scientists. So there is a big group of uh, biologists working with uh, VOCs from the ecological perspective and try to understand interactions within 
between plants and insects, for example. And then there is another group of uh, scientists trying to do very accurate measurements of BOC release from biological sources uh, to understand the uh, emissions to the atmosphere. So my group is somewhere in between these two larger groups uh, and combines ecological and atmospheric aspects. And then let's move over to the Arctic area. So this uh, graph, it shows um, latitudinal distribution of uh, VOC emissions. So we have the equator here and then South Pole and North Pole. And then we can see uh, estimated VOC emissions from biomass burning, from anthropogenic sources and from biogenic sources. So uh, this is a few, year, few years old uh, modeling estimate. But what you can see, the main uh, uh, message from this would be that uh, majority of the VOCs is released from biogenic sources like vegetation. And then also that hardly anything is released in the Arctic. So that's a quite a depressing start for a talk that focuses on the VOC emissions from the Arctic ecosystems. Maybe we should just stop here. <laughs> but let's, let's continue a little bit uh, after all. Because I think one of my points is that uh, our current models are going wrong. And we come back to this at the end. So if, if you Google the Arctic, this is what it looks like. So snow, ice uh, and uh, extreme conditions. And this is more the Arctic uh, where I work. This uh, photo is taken from the high Arctic, the most extreme uh, Arctic, uh, snow-free Arctic. This is from North, uh, Northeast Greenland. Sackenberg Research Station is visible there. And uh, this is one of the locations where we've done field work. And uh, these Arctic uh, ecosystems, uh, they do have vegetation. So there is uh, low plant biomass that is very active. So they have a short growing season that they use very efficiently. And I think that's one of the uh, reasons why we see quite, quite high uh, VOC emissions from, from these ecosystems, considering the biomass uh, that's present. In some places, the biomass is uh, really low. It's mainly bare, barren soil. In some places, uh, the bushes grow quite high. One of the specialties also that uh, the growing season is very short, like I said, but the day is very long in the summer. So we have midnight sun, this photo was taken when we did some measurements over 24 hours. So this is taken two o'clock at night, night. So the sun is shining and we can work long hours. Something that's uh, really relevant is, is that global warming is causing what we call Arctic greening. So areas that are now tundra vegetation, so small shrubs, uh, they are getting small trees and the trees and shrubs are getting so more higher and uh, more biomass. And the uh, polar deserts that, uh, that are at the moment barren, they are slowly getting uh, tundra-like. So there are really large changes going on in the Arctic uh, vegetation. And even though the air temperature seems pretty low, uh, it's not uh, the case for the plants. So this photo was taken when we were doing Greenland on Disco Island in Greenland, uh, early summer, one day after snow melt. The thermometers showed 14 degrees Celsius. Now I'm not sure what it's in Fahrenheit, uh, but it's normally here in Denmark, I have a winter coat uh, and uh, it's pretty chilly, but uh, in Greenland, it felt really, really hot. And why is that? That is because the surface is really efficiently heating up uh, when it's clear sky conditions. So when we measure the vegetation surface temperatures, uh, they are usually uh, at least 10 degrees higher than air temperature. 
So there are several reasons why the models go wrong, and this is the major reason that uh, air temperature is used in the models and the actual leaf temperature of the Arctic plants is really difficult to estimate. And of course, Arctic is warming very fast. Some areas of the Arctic are uh, at the moment warming by one degree per decade. So it's, it's seriously fast and uh, uh, really uh, drastic warming. So I used to write that the Arctic areas are warming twice as fast as the global average. That was like the uh, line that we wrote in all the articles. But now I've noticed that people write three times faster and three times more than, than the global average. So uh, things are speeding up. So then let's get a bit more into the topic. Uh, we wanted to assess how does climate warming affect release of VOCs from the Arctic tundra. And how we do these measurements uh, where we study experimental warming effects, we do them out uh, in the Arctic tundra. And uh, we use enclosure based measurements like here in the photo. So we have this chamber that we place on top of the area we want to measure. And we sample the air, we bring the samples uh, back to the lab and analyze them by GCMS. That's gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And uh, the work that uh, I start with is, is done in these long-term manipulation experiments that we have in different uh, places in the Arctic. Um, so we have uh, some in northeast Greenland that I showed one photo of, and then on the west coast of Greenland, and then in northern Scandinavia. And in these experiments, we have different climate treatments that mimic the future climate. So it could be a shading tent that mimics increasing cloudiness. It could be these kind of uh, open top chambers that increase air temperature inside here by uh, two to four degrees, depending on the location. And uh, here we have a snow fence uh, that accumulates snow on one side of the fence, increasing the snow depth and uh, insulating the soil in the winter. So these different climate treatments, they are always replicated in, uh, in uh, so that we have, let's say six or more uh, replicates of each treatment that we have enough uh, coverage of the variation in the area. There are some challenges in this work and one is that uh, the areas that we they measure, they are very heterogeneous. So these photos here, they are from the same experiment and uh, you can see that there are much more grass-like plants here and more shrubs here and there are different species. We may have flowers in some plots more than others. There may be animals that we have to be afraid of or aware of. And sometimes the weather gives us uh, some challenges. But let's start our uh, look into the results from Abisko, Northern Sweden, where we have been working in an experiment where we have a warming treatment arranged by these uh, open top tents and then addition of leaves of the uh, mountain birch forest that surrounds the area. And uh, when we do these measurements by the technique that I mentioned, we do them at different dates manually. So they are snapshots in time. There's high variation. Uh, the conditions of the particular day affect uh, the results that we get. So here is data shown for monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes over two summers. And it's of course really difficult for us to now uh, see the patterns here. We can see that uh, there is a double view in, on top of many of the dates showing that warming has a significant effect. But I've summarized the results in this graph where we have uh, the total BVOC emission on y-axis and then we have the different treatments in this experiment on 
x-axis. So we have the control plots with no treatment. Then we have warming by two degrees. Then we have litter addition, which is these uh, mountain birch leaves, and then a combination of the two. And what we found out was that litter addition didn't have any effects uh, on BVOC emissions from these ecosystem plots, but warming doubled the emissions and uh, it increased emissions of all of these different BVOC groups. We went back five years later to the same uh, experiment and uh, the responses had gotten a lot stronger. So we had now large difference to the warming treatments and now also the litter addition treatment had uh, caused a significant effect and the reason why this development why the results uh, and responses develop like this over time is that uh, the plant uh, species composition and biomass starts to change so there was more plant biomass that can emit more vocs in these treatments and also different species composition. So the litter addition treatment, it works a bit like fertilizer for the plants. If we looked at the uh, individual compounds that were emitted, uh, we could see some interesting results there as well. So this is the principal component analysis of the composition of the BVOC profile. And what we could see was that uh, it was especially some sesquiterpenes, some reactive compounds that were increased by this future mimicking treatment with warming and litter addition. So not only the amount, but also the composition of the emissions changed. Now let's move over to another experiment in Greenland. And in this experiment, we had this reduced sunlight treatment, but I don't tell anything about that now. I focus on the warming treatment instead. And here the story was a bit different. In this experiment, uh, warming actually decreased plant biomass. So both uh, the two dominant species, crowberry, that is a, an evergreen shrub, and willow, decreased in abundance. And that was because warming caused uh, drought stress for the plants. This is a really dry tundra site and the extra warming uh, yeah, was too much uh, for the plants. So we don't always see this increase in biomass. And in some areas, this is actually uh, described as Arctic browning. Uh, so it's not always greening. And now, okay, we would think then that uh, BVOC emission then decreased because plant biomass decreased, but that was actually not the case. So during our campaign, we consistently measured clearly higher emissions in the warming treatment shown in the white than in the control treatment uh, shown with the gray symbols. And again, if I summarize this for the whole growing season, we could see that uh, there were several fold higher emissions in the warming than in the control. And in this ecosystem as well, isoprene was the dominant uh, emitted compound. Here in this site, we also looked at the, uh, the components of the ecosystem. So we measured on the two dominant plant species, the willow and the crowberry. And we also measured on bare soil. And we could see that the response is related to plants. So in both plant species, we saw an increase in warming, while in the soil, uh, bare soil, there was no significant difference under warming. So we could show that it's plant response that drives this uh, increasing bulk emission from ecosystem level in the tundra. And uh, we've done measurements in, in several sites and it's a really consistent response that we see. So no matter if the experiment has been just started or if it has been running for 10 years or 20 years, uh, we see a similar strong 
response, so increasing emissions. Then we wanted to look at uh, where does this uh, extra VOC release come from? Is it just released from storage deposits that some of these plants have? So here is uh, some electron microscopy pictures of uh, this uh, Arctic uh, heather. And uh, you can see that the leaves are covered with these spikes. And these are called trichomes that uh, can store uh, secondary metabolites and volatiles. And uh, then we did this experiment uh, using 13C labeling to test um, if the plants actually synthesize uh, compounds differently in uh, control and warming treatment. And in this setup using uh, 13C labeling, we were feeding the plants with this 13C label CO2. Uh, then plants took it up in photosynthesis and we could see that uh, they released uh, labeled VOCs. And we could also show that uh, the synthesis increased with warming. So both synthesis rates and also the release from the and the evaporation from the storage pools is increasing with, with warming. Let's move uh, down to soil then. What can we say about uh, soil? When we talk about Arctic areas, uh, we cannot uh, not talk about permafrost when we, when we focus on, on the soils. And this map, it shows uh, the expected permafrost thaw areas. So the red areas are expected to be fully thawed already by 2050, the orange ones 2100, and the yellow ones are expected to still have some permafrost 2100. But drastic changes are taking place. And when permafrost uh, thaws, it means that uh, this active layer that is on top of the frozen soil layer uh, gets larger. And we expect that more carbon gases are released from the permafrost soil. There is a lot of studies showing that CO2 production and methane production and release from the thawing permafrost is, is increasing. So we were wondering, OK, what about VOCs? Does the thawing permafrost release uh, some of these gases then? We brought home some permafrost samples from Greenland, and uh, these samples were kept frozen during the transport. So they were still frozen permafrost when we got them in the lab. And then we built this setup where we had uh, glass uh, jars, which we connected uh, to a PTR TOF MS, a proton transfer reaction time of flight mass spectrometer. Uh, with a system that uh, used valves uh, to switch between the different samples so that we could measure in real time uh, what gases are released when the permafrost thaws. And then we had two kinds of uh, sample setups. So we had samples where we had uh, permafrost alone, and then we had samples with permafrost and active layer soil. And let's see what we found out then. If, if we look at the screenshot from the PTR TOF uh, MS uh, controlling computer, we could see that something interesting is going on. So we saw high amounts of uh, VOCs uh, released from the permafrost. But when we had these jars with the active layer soil sharing the headspace, but not in contact with permafrost, we saw decreasing amounts. So with mineral soil, some decrease. When we had organic soil, there was really large decrease in, uh, and maybe sometimes even lower amounts being released than in, in our background samples uh, of uh, ambient air. So what does this mean? Well, we saw that uh, there was a really large release of uh, some compounds and especially ethanol and methanol. And these were really quite high amounts. Uh, uh, if, if this amount would be released to the atmosphere, it would uh, really affect the 
ethanol budget uh, in the Arctic. All in all, around 300 different organic ions were, were released from the permafrost. But then it's another question, how much of this uh, release would actually get to the atmosphere? Because when we combined uh, the samples uh, of the active layer into these same incubations, the picture changed. So here we have the emissions uh, from the permafrost alone, now shown for ethanol and methanol that were the most dominant VOCs. And then when we added the active layer soil, the release really, really decreased drastically. So here the red samples, they show the uh, samples with mineral soil. And then when we had the organic soil, uh, hardly anything happened. So it seems like there is this filtering of uh, the compounds produced in the permafrost. And we were wondering if it was actually biological uptake of the VOCs or was it physical chemical uh, filtering that was uh, taking place. Then we proceeded to study that. So we conducted this experiment where we used 14 C labeled VVOCs and incubated uh, soil samples with these labeled VOCs uh, and studied how much uh, 14 C labeled CO2 is produced uh, from these uh, incubations. And we compared sterilized and not sterilized soil samples. So it was a very simple experimental setup where we could see if we kill the microbes, what happens? And if the microbes are living, then what happens? And I can tell that nothing happened in the sterilized soil. So there was no uptake of VOCs uh, with the sterilized soil. But in the uh, soil where the microbes were living, uh, the compounds were mineralized extremely fast. And this is now shown for methanol here. So just after an hour, almost all of the methanol was consumed. We studied this then with different model compounds, and uh, it seemed that we haven't at least so far found any uh, volatile organic compound that the microbes wouldn't uh, mineralize to CO2. So we can see that sterilized samples, uh, nothing happens in them, but the different uh, compounds that we've tested, they are taken up and turned into CO2 at different uh, rates and at the different uh, levels. So when there is less CO2 coming, more of this compound is then taken up in the biomass of the microbes instead. And we could see some tendencies for differences. So compounds like this uh, cymine, that is a monoterpene-like uh, compound, uh, was taken up uh, more efficiently in uh, coniferous forest soil, where these kind of compounds are common than in beach forest soil that is not experiencing these kind of compounds. And uh, I think this is quite interesting and uh, perhaps uh, deserves some future work uh, by microbiologists to look more into. And I think also it's interesting uh, to speculate if this microbial uptake could be so relevant like methane oxidation in soils. So we have ongoing work uh, focusing on coupling BBOC exchange in soils to microbial community and functions. And, and uh, so we are interested in uh, BBOC production under different com conditions and uh, studying the uptake uh, process uh, by soil microbes. We're doing some uh, metagenomics uh, and possibly also transcriptomics and proteomics to couple the uh, function and structure uh, to these processes. So we are doing these kind of studies with, for example, with samples uh, from uh, permafrost collected now across the Arctic. The results so far I, I showed they were only from Greenland. And then we have some uh, samples from a retreating glacier where we can uh, look at the microbial community that's developing and go 
further away the glacier where the where the microbial community has longer time history and the same with the depth uh, in soil then let's move to a bit larger scale uh, and uh, to what the tundra uh, voc emissions uh, look like in a bit larger perspective so we did some dynamic uh, vegetation modeling to compare temperature effects to vegetation change effects. And what our uh, this uh, panarctic uh, simulation showed was that uh, for isoprene, we can expect uh, these kind of changes uh, after 15 years of four degree temperature increase. And why we selected this time scale was that in this study, we compared the results uh, to our uh, manipulation experiment results that had been running for the same time period. And what, what you can see here is that there are some uh, spatial differences in the polar region, but in general, the, we can expect uh, something like 60 to more than 100% increase due to this kind of uh, temperature uh, change. Now we have to remember that, uh, of course, many other factors are changing, not only uh, temperature. And uh, one other factor that we tested for here was uh, the changes in vegetation. So we run the model also for uh, uh, letting the vegetation change dynamically in response to this temperature. Uh, and this uh, simulation that I'm showing here on the right, the results are from a run where temperature effects are subtracted. So we are looking at only uh, vegetation change related uh, responses. So what we can see here that is that now we have much larger differences spatially. So in some areas we have more than 100% increases and that's really uh, mainly here in the northernmost uh, areas of the of the region in some areas we have even decreases of isoprene emission and that's because the vegetation is changing uh, from isoprene emitting species to monoterpene emitting species for example so we can expect also differences in the uh, composition uh, of the emissions to the atmosphere We've been doing also some eddy covariance measurements. Uh, that means flux measurements in large scale. And here is a photo of one of these uh, campaigns where we transported the PTR TOF with a helicopter to the site. And that was uh, really, uh, yeah, horrible uh, for me to look at this uh, shaky transport and the instrument hanging in the thin thread in the air. But uh, the helicopter pilot was amazingly talented to land it softly and uh, what we did afterwards was uh, uh, build a hut around it so this is the instrument after the helicopter pilot landed it perfectly on our uh, landing spot and then we built a hut around it uh, and uh, started the measurements and uh, in these measurements we measured a tundra ecosystem uh, area and uh, coupled uh, the BVOC flux measurements to remote sensing data. So in this remote sensing setup, uh, we have time-lapse cameras uh, taking photographs uh, of the area, spectral sensors looking at the greenness of the vegetation and thermal images so that we can uh, look at the vegetation temperatures uh, and from these thermal images we can also go to species level to look at the temperatures there. Um, what our flux data uh, showed is that uh, the current models they really go wrong. So this is how the current models expect uh, the isoprene flux uh, from tundra uh, to respond to temperature. So this is the temperature response curve uh, expected. And uh, we expect that the Q10, so the increase in the emission per 10 degree temperature change 
is supposed to be three times increase in the emission. So what our data showed was this. So if we use the vegetation surface temperature, uh, then 10 degree uh, temperature change increases the emissions 14 fold. And uh, the problem is that models don't use this. Uh, the models use air temperature. And if we plot our data with against air temperature, a 10 fold increase in temperature gives a 130 fold increase in isoprene fluxes. So we are really in urgently needing to update uh, the models uh, to better uh, track the tundra emissions because these ecosystems are changing very fast uh, and uh, really drastically. And at the moment, the models are really are not able to capture the emissions uh, from these ecosystems. So with that, uh, I want to uh, stop here and let you ask questions you have. I think in my abstract, I had promised to say a few words about uh, insect herbivory and insect outbreaks. Uh, but I thought that uh, that would be really a topic for another seminar. Uh, so if somebody's interested in that, I can also tell something about that. I can just say that uh, temperature has large impacts, but in short term, insect uh, feeding can cause even larger impacts and the effects of temperature actually amplify the response uh, to insect herbivory. So in areas where there are insect outbreaks, this can really be a significant modifier of the volatile uh, emissions to the atmosphere. So with that, thanks a lot for, for listening.